Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. This one written by Gavin, read by me, format of the show if you're new here. First of all, welcome! As I've never read this before, we're gonna find out about these dark hidden mysteries together. Do you know what? I feel like we just did an episode like this. So maybe it did well, and we're doing another one. Let's just jump in, shall we? We've talked a lot about internet mysteries on this channel over the years. And there's no shortage of them. Oftentimes, what makes these stories so mysterious is just how little information there is surrounding them. While that definitely leaves a lot more open to the imagination in terms of just how spooky and unsettling a story may be, it also means that those stories can't necessarily carry a full episode by themselves. But they're still stories worth covering, and that brings us to today's episode. Today's format will be a little bit different, because we'll be looking at not one, but three different stories that for one reason or another never made it onto this channel before today i think because maybe they're a bit just a bit too short like this channel's generally like podcast first so you know longer format lean back experience maybe you're listening in your car that sort of thing ever thought skincare is just for the ladies well think again because today i want to talk about the ufo3 from foria have you ever noticed that your skin feels all dried out a little bit rough i mean especially during the winter but it can be all year round well this is a deep facial hydration device and it can boost your skin's moisture by 126 in just two minutes and if you're worried about wrinkles and as a man who is rapidly approaching and <clears throat> may already at be at middle age well this will help with those wrinkles. It'll reduce their appearance in just one week. The UFO3 isn't just about hydration. It also uses warming thermotherapy to help your skin soak in mask ingredients, making your skin look plump and smooth. Plus, with LED therapy, it tackles signs of aging like a pro. And for the tech savvy, you can customize your treatments via the Foreo app. It's a perfect gift for that special someone or just as a treat for yourself. Click the link below to get 30% off and use the code 10DTU for an additional 10% discount, but that's for the first 50 people only. Big thank you to Foreo for sponsoring today's video and now let's get back to it uh, among them is the channel's most requested internet mystery Ooh, one that i had previously refused to cover Ooh, i hope you all enjoy this slight departure from the normal form because there are plenty of other mysteries out there that i could use for future anthologies and if not i guess it's back to trying to convince simon that ghosts and cryptids are real yeah good luck with that it's been what nearly two years we've been doing this channel still not real joanna lopez the yeah. year 1989, and a young Barack Obama had just finished up his night working as a summer associate at a local Chicago law firm. Once he left work, he headed over to his buddy Michael Jordan's $3 million penthouse, where the two planned to spend the evening vegging out on the couch together, watching TV and smoking a fat blunt. Um, What? That cannot be true. Is that possibly true? Is there any reason that these two would ever known each other, let alone be friends? Of course not, but they're literally the only two people I can think of who were living in Chicago at this time, so I'm going to need you to get off my back and just roll with this clearly fictitious framing device. <laughs> Kevin, you had me going for almost a second there. Anyway, the pair were relaxing and having a good time, making conversation while Chicago's NBC affiliate, WMAQ Channel 5, provided some background noise. It was getting late, though, and they were about to experience something that I was all too familiar with back in 1989. So, Kevin, you're only a couple of years older than me. Why don't you like, f I, I feel like I was two years old in 1989, so Kevin would be like four? It's something that seems incomprehensible to Zoomers and the sort of thing that they've only heard about in stories like this. You see, back in the 1980s and early 1990s, and of course in decades preceding this, we didn't have streaming internet or really any internet to entertain us. Oh my god, it was basically like now, if, if I had went back in time and it was like pre-internet, the amount I'd be lost. I would be a lost person. There'd be you know, anything I need to do, I'd just have no idea. Be like, do I do I have to phone someone? Do I have to go to a library? Do I have to get a book? What happens? You also couldn't turn on your extended cable package and watch news, comedy, cartoon, sports, cooking, and every other genre imaginable 24 hours a day. Back then, our TVs had one knob and only went from 2 to 13, and another knob for the handful of UHF stations in your area. And most importantly, those stations weren't on air all day long. Oh, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. When I was a kid, literally until I was a teenager, maybe not a teenager, I was pretty young. There were four channels. You had a choice of four channels. BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, and the creatively named Channel Four. Channel Five, also creatively named, ca named, came along quite a bit later and showed CSI. And these were all absolutely loaded up with adverts, except for BBC, where you didn't have to have adverts, but you had to have a TV license. It's kind of like a gun license for Americans, except for TV. 
Stations would sign off their broadcasts sometime between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m., usually ending by playing the national anthem while showing an American flag waving in the breeze. Wow. In the UK, we just got an image of, I think it was just some random girl sitting at a chalkboard playing noughts and crosses. And it would just be going, beep, and then program, like, when the channel was off the air, which seems insane now. <laughs> it's like, why would you broadcast that when you, just, when you could be broadcasting... I don't know, reruns and stuff them full of adverts because some money is better than no money. You know, just in case you forgot what country your TV was in. They would then show some sort of test pattern, often just a series of colored bars, and an obnoxious single tone would play throughout the night. The stations would then stay off the air until usually 5 or 6 a.m., at which point they would begin the day again by playing the national anthem. As a kid, I'd frequently catch this early playing of the anthem while getting ready for school in the morning. I'd turn on the TV, get a bowl of cereal, or waiting for samurai pizza cats to start. Now I don't know what's real and what's fake, Kevin. Is Samurai Pizza Cats actually a TV show, or is it as real as Michael Jordan Brackeramp but Obama smoking a fat blunt? And sometimes oh, I'd be awake before the station had actually started its programming for the morning, but more often I'd catch it at night. I'd always been a night person, which is not ideal as a child for whom school started at 7am. Holy sh**, Kevin, my school started at... Well, registration was from 8 to 8.25, and then school would start like at 8.30. So I think you could arrive any time between 8 and 8.25, if I remember correctly. And then you'd be off to like first activity or first class or whatever it was that day. Assembly. Chapel. By 8.30. And I frequently fell asleep watching TV only to be awoken by the horrible test pattern sound. Well, that's like telling you it's time to go to bed. Like, get up off the couch and go to bed. However, what Obama and Jordan saw that night was something entirely different from the usual sign-off. WMAQ played the national anthem as always, but instead of a test pattern, they instead showed this image. And for our audio listeners today, I will briefly describe it as not to bore the video people who can see this. It's a missing poet person's photograph, uh, a poster, sorry, with a photograph of a... Uh, what seems to be a child the resolution is very low missing and then the name of the person is jana lopez and then there's a phone number beneath it that's it this image would remain on screen for hours until the station resumed its scheduled programming the next morning however to many who saw it it was extremely unsettling reports of missing children weren't uncommon on network affiliates but usually there was some sort of context how old was the person where were they last seen what were they wearing that sort of thing. None of that was present for Joanna Lopez. Instead of the typical voiceover that would explain who she was, this singular image was broadcast for hours in absolute silence other than the ambient static hum of shitty old television. See, I still remember that sound like an old TV switching on, like the cathode ray to you where it fires up, and then you turn it off. Oh, I feel so old. Oh God, I'm gonna be 40 soon. You know, like three and a bit years, but come on. There was no explanation of who she was, where she disappeared from, who the phone number was for, or why they picked the creepiest and least identifiable picture of the missing girl possible. I was beginning to wonder if it was just like my e-reader screen here, but yeah, you could barely see this person. Seriously, they'd probably have been better off just asking a toddler to draw a picture of Joanna than using this picture. It's extremely low resolution and looks like a horrible photocopy of the original image, and that gives the photo a very off-putting quality. Perhaps because the quality is so poor, none of Joanna's facial features are clearly defined, and the giant 1980s-style glasses she's wearing almost make her look like some sort of insect person. I didn't even realize she was wearing glasses. It's a really bad photo. You can't even tell what like ethnicity she is. I couldn't even tell if this was a girl or a boy. To many people who saw this image, it haunted them. Joanna's image resided in the uncanny valley, the psychological phenomenon where something looks simultaneously almost human and not human enough. This tends to cause an unsettling emotional reaction, and for many people, this picture would stick with them for years. However, for the public at large, especially since few people would have been awake to even see the station sign off for the night, this story was just a whole lot of nothing. Chicago was in the midst of a resurgence of violent crime. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Chicago's got a resurgence of something negative in 1989, so missing persons reports weren't typically given the attention that they deserved. Police had plenty of cases that were definitely murder or kidnappings, 
and the time they needed to spend on those left precious little time for focusing on people who probably just ran away on their own. And since she wasn't a lost little white girl, the odds of anyone caring were dramatically decreased. Oh, okay, well, there we go. As a result, nothing came of this missing persons broadcast. But then, two years later, in 1991, it was aired again. This time, it wasn't left up all night. It was only aired for 10 seconds before being replaced with the standard test pattern. The rebroadcast image looked like it was slightly higher resolution, but it's unclear whether that was the result of more effort being put in or whether the higher quality transmission technology that had been implemented in the two years since made for the difference. Um... I think maybe they're testing something. Maybe someone at the TV network thought it'd be a good idea to broadcast pictures of, you know, missing children or whatever instead of just the, the pointless boop, no broadcasting sound. And maybe they just made this in, like, whatever 1980s Photoshop is. I guess, like, a photocopier and, like, writing things out. Maybe typewriters? I don't know. It's the 1980s. I wasn't around. Um, something like that to test it out and see what, whether it works and stuff. I think this it feels like a test. I don't think this is a real person. I'm not sure, though. Regardless of which was the case, again Joanna's story vanished into obscurity. It would take nearly 30 years before anyone started seriously looking into Joanna's case and whether or not she was ever found. It began in August of 2009, although nobody was going to notice for another 10 years. There's an organization known as the Museum of Classic Chicago Television, FuzzyMemories.tv, that is seeking to archive all of the classic PSAs, sign-offs, and other local programming that aired on Chicago television. This is not an official archive run by any of the local networks, most of whom probably don't still have those old tapes anyway. Instead, the videos are collected from anyone who happens to still have VHS recordings of local Chicago TV from back in the day. How long does VHS last? I feel like there's a there's a lifespan on that, or maybe only if it's watched over and over again. Because it's an analog format, it's it's gonna degrade, right? Among the videos uploaded in 2009 was the WMAQ sign-off from January 14th, 1989, when the Joanna Lopez poster first aired. Six years later, they uploaded the video to their YouTube channel, but it is a small and extremely niche type of content, so these videos weren't going to instantly blow up. Or maybe blow up ever. Very, very niche. In October of 2012, another YouTube channel named Dat Commercial uploaded the sign-off from 1991. This one didn't include a specific date, but the fact that the missing poster appeared in higher but still terrible quality, coupled with its switching to the test pattern after 10 seconds, showed that it was clearly a different instance of Joanna's image being featured on the channel. These videos sat online for years, going as unnoticed as the original broadcast. But then, suddenly, out of nowhere, this story took the internet by storm. There are only two places that a mystery like this tends to gain sudden traction. I already know what they are. One of them's Reddit. The other's probably 4chan. 4chan and Reddit! I've done too many of these. And it's also Kevin. I feel like 4chan and Reddit are gonna come up. This time it was Reddit that caught wind of the weird poster, though why they did is still somewhat of a mystery. Perhaps it began with a search for information about the Max Headroom hijacking that we previously covered on this channel. That's another one. I feel I've covered that many times. It's when someone like hijacked a, a radio, a television broadcast and just broadcast a dude wearing a Max Headroom mask and like dancing and stuff. It was weird. Never been solved as far as I'm aware. That story also took place in Chicago, and recordings of the hijacking have been archived by the Museum of Classic Chicago Television. It's possible someone was looking through the channel's other YouTube videos just to see what other interesting oddities they had, or if there were other recordings of the Max Headroom incident causing them to stumble across the image of Joanna Lopez. That's my personal guess, but how the missing poster was finally noticed doesn't really matter. What mattered is that Reddit immediately jumped all over the mystery, trying to find out everything they could. Right out of the gates, there were a lot of questions that needed to be answered. But when people went looking, it only sparked more curiosity. Because there was absolutely nothing to find. There were no newspaper articles about her disappearance and no police records. Joanna also isn't listed in any missing persons database. I'm really thinking this is just a test. Someone just randomly chose a name and was just like, we're testing this. Not only were all of the details of her disappearance unclear, but suddenly it was unclear whether or not she even disappeared in the first place. I mean, how could a TV station run a missing poster like that for several hours without any information about the disappearance existing? This immediately led to some outlandish theories. For example, what was the phone number that appeared on the screen? 
Perhaps Joanna had been kidnapped, and the phone number was so that her family could call her to hear the ransom. It was believed that this would explain why none of the information that normally appeared in the case of a missing person was present. The party responsible for having the poster aired already had the girl, so they didn't actually need anyone to find her. What? And they just wrote to the local affiliate, the wrote to the local TV station, being like, "Hey, I've kidnapped a girl. Can you broadcast this image so that her family can see it?" You wouldn't do that. You'd just phone the family and be like, "Yo." Here's how it's gonna work. In a similar vein, there was also the theory that this may have been some sort of human trafficking scheme and the phone number was for people who wanted to purchase the girl. Again, this is ridiculously outlandish. I don't think that's how this sort of crime works, guys. One of the big discoveries that potentially lent credence to theories like this was that it was the only time that something like this ever happened. People scoured through the Retro TV Museum and asked Chicago locals, but there was nothing. Joanna's poster was the only one to ever air on WMAQ like this while the station was off the air, and it aired twice two years apart. So why? Are you guys on board with my theory that it's a test? I feel like it's definitely a test of some kind. Maybe. Another slightly less wild but implausible theory is that this was another hijacking, like the Max Headroom incident. It was argued that Joanna's picture was the only one to ever wear because it was a hacked signal. They deliberately used a shitty, unidentifiable photo of someone just to scare and confuse people, and the phone number was a fake. These were among the early theories, but they were rather easily debunked. On the idea of it being a hijacking, the image was on screen for hours. Even if the station was off the air at that point, there's no f way that nobody at the station was going to notice and take action. Max Headroom was barely able to hijack the signal for 90 seconds, and this was two years later. The networks would have made it much harder by then. The second broadcast also becomes essentially inexplicable under this theory. Yeah, this is just, uh, there's no evidence for this, I don't believe it. It's too complex just to achieve something so pointless for so long. As for the idea that the missing poster was made by Joanna's kidnapper, this flew out of the window as soon as the phone number was identified. And honestly, someone from Chicago should have been able to silence those theories from the start. The phone number was 312-744-5594. People tried contacting the number once the mystery exploded, but it was out of service. Yeah, it's been like 20-some-30 years, guys. Many people immediately took this as a sign that the phone number had never existed at all, rather than considering that maybe something had changed in the last 30 fucking years since it was first aired. My annoyance about that oversight aside, 312 is the area code for Chicago. That part everyone would have looked up and been satisfied with. However, what someone from Chicago could have mentioned to people is that the prefix 744 is almost unally associated with official City of Chicago government phone numbers. This was as true in 1989 as it is today, and somebody really should have brought this to everyone attention to stop the ridiculous wild goose chases. Or maybe they did try, but they got shouted down because they were ruining everybody's conspiracy theories. In the end, it was determined that in 1989 the phone number that appeared on the screen belonged to Joe P. Mayo, commander of the Youth Division of the Chicago Police Department. Well, makes sense to have his number on the screen then, doesn't it? Not only did that rule out any notion that the poster was created by Joanna's abductor, but it confirmed that she was a minor at the time of her disappearance. But. This did lead to another theory. Maybe it was just a test. Perhaps the, yes, here we go. Perhaps the network wanted to try something new with these overnight missing posters, so they took a deliberately unrecognizable photo of someone at the station's daughter, gave her a fake name, and made a mock-up of what this type of broadcast would look like to test it out. That would explain the lack of evidence that Joanna Lopez actually went missing, because she didn't. Okay, good. This is my theory. I like this theory. While I get to the logic, I personally am surprised this theory became as popular as it did. I'm not at all. Anytime the public is asked for help with a police investigation, they get inundated with bullshit leads and fake sightings and whatnot. There's no reason that wouldn't happen this time as well, assuming anyone saw the broadcast. You'd think that they'd have the sense to stamp this is just a test over the screen and to print a 555 phone number instead of the correct number for those sorts of things. Uh, 555 is, is maybe, this is an American thing, but I know this for some reason. It's, uh, it's not a real area code. So in movies, where they're always like, yeah, just call me at 555, it's because it doesn't exist and they won't hassle anyone. And in case Simon or international viewers, oh, Kevin's about to explain it to us, isn't he? <laughs> in the United States, there is no 555 area code, nor do any area codes use the 555 prefix in numbers. There is only one specific use case for those numbers that never comes up. So putting 555 in a phone number is shorthand for this is fiction. 
If it was just a test, surely something like this would have been done so viewers knew that there wasn't really a missing girl. Not only that, but Chicago already had plenty of genuine missing people. Even if the overnight broadcast was experimental, why run a fake missing poster instead of a real one? I think just because people don't think about this stuff very much. There's probably someone who's like at the thing being like, hey, can't we just do a missing poster? Yo, 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 intern John. Go mock up a poster and intern John goes off and he finds a crappy photograph. He finds a number that would be typically used. He chooses a name at random. He photocopies it together and gives it to his boss. Done. Jobs are good in. I, I think people just don't think about this. They, they just don't think very hard. A dedicated subreddit was created to pursue this mystery and try and figure out who Joanna was, what happened to her, and why the only mentions of her disappearance were two obscure and bizarre broadcasts. Members did everything they could in search of information, including talking to people at WMAQ. Shockingly, despite it being so many years later, they did get some answers. Of course, those answers were not terribly helpful, instead only raising even more questions. According to someone who worked at the station back in 1989, this was very much a real broadcast. It was not a text, a hoax, or a hijack signal. But the reason <coughs> there was no information given about Joanna and her last known whereabouts is because the station didn't know any of that. The request to air this missing poster was made by an anonymous caller who said they were going to call back with more information, though they never did. As for the low-quality photo, people were correct that this was a photocopy. If the request came in via phone, I'd assume that it had been faxed, so the station never had the actual photograph to work with. However, the person who Internet Detective spoke to said it was clear it was an individual calling. It was not a representative of the police or an organization dedicated to missing people or even a home for foster children. It was just some random person. As such, technically, that doesn't rule out the possibility that it was still a hoax and just one that the TV station wasn't in on, but it's still bizarre, a bizarre set of circumstances. Reddit has also made numerous FOIA requests to the police and even to the FBI, though these requests all turned up zero results for reports concerning a Joanna Lopez. The official story for internet investigators is that Illinois is a body present state, meaning that a missing person is considered alive unless a body is found. If Joanna was considered alive and the investigation open, this would mean that the police had the authority to withhold documents from FOIA evidence. <laughs> you could be immortal in, uh, in Chicago. Just make sure they never find your body. While this seems to have been accepted as fact, as far as I can tell, it's actually absolute bullshit. I can't find any references to the term body present state that aren't from the subreddit itself, indicating that it's not an actual term. More importantly, the laws in Illinois are similar to the laws in most states. In Illinois, a person is considered alive for the first seven years and adequate proof of death is required to have them declared dead. After seven years, it flips and a missing person is presumed dead, instead requiring adequate proof that they're alive in order for them to be declared alive. I made a video about this ages ago, about what it's like if you've been declared dead and then you show up and how difficult it is to become alive again. <laughs> People are like, you don't have a credit history. According to our banking details, you're dead. We can't give you a credit card. You're trying to steal someone's identity, and apparently it takes just years and years for all of this stuff to figure itself out. There was even a very high-profile case in Illinois in recent years when someone wanted her missing husband declared dead before the seven years were up for insurance purposes, though she wound up having to wait the full seven years. Anyway, it's been 35 years, so while it would still be an open cold case, Joanna would very much be presumed dead at this point. Unfortunately, this is the problem with pretty much all the information surrounding a mystery that only exists on Reddit with the official source listed as Trust Me Bro. To the best of my knowledge, the idea of a body present state is completely made up bullshit that awkwardly has gone without being fact checked for years. Well, we did that today, didn't we, Kevin? Well done. Since we can disprove the idea that a missing person would still be considered alive after 35 years, there are two remaining reasons why the FOIA requests wouldn't have turned up anything. Either records surrounding Joanna's disappearance have been lost or destroyed, or they never existed in the first place. But the lack of official documentation wasn't going to stop people from searching for Joanna. One discovery made was from the 1989 West Chicago Community High School yearbook. It seemed like a reasonable place to go looking for Joanna, though she wasn't in it. However, they did find this picture of Rachel Lopez, who was perceived as bearing a striking resemblance to Joanna. I mean, yeah, maybe she's also wearing the big glasses, but that first picture was so dark, it's just basically you can't tell. Is it possible that the missing girl's legal name was Rachel and she just went by Joanna? Is that why searching records for Joanna turned up nothing? Honestly, this lead struck me as someone who saw two low-quality black and white images of girls wearing giant 1980s sunglasses and decided that they must be the same person. The parts of their faces that aren't obscured by glasses don't look particularly similar, 
though admittedly more of their faces are covered by glasses than not so it's easy to fixate on that similarity of course it didn't take long to disprove this theory rachel appeared in the yearbooks in 1990 1991 and 1992 as well for this to be the person in question she would have had to have disappeared in 1989 been found and then disappeared again in 1991. maybe anyway there is a theory that the second broadcast of joanna was a mistake which is why it was only aired for 10 seconds but there's no way to know whether or not that's the case more importantly however people contacted the high school and they confirmed that rachel never went missing okay so just because two people look vaguely alike from super grainy photos not the same person who could have ever known in an attempt to give people something better to work with several users attempted to clean up the image that was broadcast maybe if people could actually see a reasonable approximation as to what joanna looked like it would be easier to identify and locate her there were several attempts made of varying quality by far the highest quality restoration of the photo which was accompanied by a detailed step-by-step -step process of how the image was restored came from a username as the lava hot shits <laughs> welcome to the internet everybody anyway this is what he came up with okay pretty good image based on the fact that like it was so degraded i don't it feels more like just creative artwork rather than just like yeah this is an image of the person how can you do this from the original image it was so poor quality this was a massive step up from other attempts both in terms of quality and likely resemblance to the actual girl in question lhs was clear on where guesswork was involved such as joanna's hair texture but overall it looks like it was a well thought out and carefully executed process that's all well and good but a better picture wasn't going to be enough to solve this mystery after all if joanna or her family were aware that the internet was looking for her surely they would have been able to identify her from the garbage quality photo that aired on tv i don't know if i could recognize my own family with a qu uh, picture quality that bad however a few years after reddit started investigating this mystery another piece of interesting information was revealed I mentioned that this was the only time WMAQ ever aired a missing persons poster like this, and for a long time that was believed to be true. But on May 16th, 2022, the Museum of Classic Chicago Television uploaded the WMAQ sign off from January the 24th, 1988. After the national anthem, the following image appeared on screen for 10 minutes. Okay, so it's another person, much clearer photo, person's called Trisha Kellett, much clearer um there's a phone number again there's also a last scene so they've added something it turns out joanna wasn't the only missing child that had aired on this channel the image was the exact same layout and featured the same phone number though this time it included the date trisha callet was last seen that was interesting for a couple of reasons first it provided further evidence that it was a real broadcast even though someone had already claimed to have gotten the information from the station but perhaps more importantly trisha had been last seen six years before this image aired that means that there's no telling whether or not joanna actually went missing in 1989 if not all of those FOIA requests may have turned up nothing because they were searching the wrong years however unlike with joanna there is information available about trish's disappearance it's an incredibly heartbreaking story in which there was a suspect immediately identified by numerous witnesses and who even stated that maybe he killed trisha though he never faced any charges the suspect was building apartments at the time and it's believed that trisha's body is in part of the cement foundation oh, holy it's like some mob thing i mean it's not but didn't they bury people in cement i'm not going to go into too much detail because it becomes increasingly infuriating the more you know but suffice to say there's a lot of information available about trisha's disappearance and she's still officially listed in multiple missing persons databases so why not joanna in an attempt to circumvent FOIA paperwork and maybe get information the police otherwise wouldn't share, one of the moderators on the Joanna Lopez subreddit contacted the police through her job. She had a job that would allow her to potentially gain access to sensitive information, and contacted them under the guise of attempting to match people in her possession with missing persons cases. But again, this got them no closer to finding Joanna. Finally, having exhausted all other resources, the moderator of Bubblegum Trad did something you should absolutely not do in a case like this one. She cold called Joanna Lopez. Holy sh! <laughs> now, that's a common name, and Chicago is a big city. Doing a very cursory search, I found dozens of Joanna Lopez's currently living in Chicago, several of whom are the right age to have been the person in question. There's far too many of them to randomly call, and, and even if there was one, she still shouldn't have to deal with a bunch of internet strangers harassing her for answers regardless bubblegum trad was confident that she had identified the correct joanna 
This level of confidence only grew during their conversation. The Joanna she spoke to said that she'd run away in 1989 when she was 18 years old, but it was only for a few days. Joanna also said that her parents wouldn't have contacted the police or the TV station. The phone call was short, with Joanna cutting it off because she said she was busy. She said she could call back within the week, but never did. Yeah, also, she has a right to be left alone, guys. Jesus. <laughs> After waiting a week, Bubba Guntrad sent a text, followed by another phone call about a month later. There was never another reply for Joanna, but the moderator was confident that this was the correct person, and Joanna Lopez was alive, well, and completely oblivious to being the center of an internet mystery. And to be fair to Joanna for ghosting Bulgum Trad, getting off the phone as fast as possible and never talking to the person again is a pretty reasonable reaction to something like this. I'd be really fucking freaked out if I'd been the one to receive that phone call. Yes, same. Leave people alone. Leave me alone. I reached out to Bubblegum Trad in the hopes of getting more information. If nothing else, I wanted to gauge her level of confidence that this really was the Joanna Lopez from the broadcast and what evidence made her so sure. As of submitting this script, I haven't heard anything back yet, but if she does get back to me, I'll be sure to comment on this video with anything relevant that comes of it. Okay, well, have a look below, everybody. Even if we take her at our word that she found the right person, though, it still doesn't answer everything. It'd be great to know that Joanna is still alive and well and was only missing for a few days. But if what she said was true, then what's the deal with the broadcast? She was allegedly very confident that her family wouldn't have reported her missing, and if that's the case, who did? Who was this anonymous person that requested Joanna's image appear on TV as a missing child? And now that we know that Joanna wasn't the only missing person to air on WMAQ, how many others were there that the Museum of Classic Chicago Television has yet to rediscover? How many VHS recordings of Channel 5 evening movies are there out there that secretly hold the names and faces of other missing children whose stories have been lost to time. Fuji Tagaken 001 Next Mystery What would you do if you were being held prisoner somewhere and forced to work against your will? <laughs> I mean, that's a very broad question. It kind of depends a lot on the situation, doesn't it? I mean, you probably work because you had no choice, but what if, amidst all the human rights violations, you suddenly found yourself with access to the internet? How would you get word out to other people about your situation? I don't know, info at fbi.gov? <laughs> Admin at scotlandyard.co.uk? I don't know. No, this is not going to be some long fiction story about how the other writers and myself are trapped in Simon's basement. Shh. While it's allegedly true that we're all chained up here and no one's allowed to leave, frankly, I could use the work and I hate the sun anyway, so I have no complaints about my current imprisonment. But that didn't appear to be the case for Redditor FujitagaKen001. The account was created on the 22nd of February 2017, and it began replying to random threads that day, continuing until March the 10th, but almost every single comment comment they made was the same. I face to serious problem of human rights at Fujitagen, Thailand. Please help me. There were only two posts that were different, one of which was clearly copy and pasted twice instead of once. The only other comment that the account made was, quote, which translates to power harassment at Fujita Geekin, Thailand. Nobody really seemed to notice these posts at first, with many just getting downvoted out of sight. After all, it's not like these comments were in any way relevant to the topics at hand. These comments were made on posts about things like a SpaceX launch or a simulated battle between one chicken and 20,000 soldiers. The battle went exactly the way you would expect. <laughs> Reddit is a weird place, isn't it? I feel like it'd be more realistic one soldier and 20,000 chickens. <laughs> Realistically, it looks like the user was just clicking on any random shit on Reddit on the popular page in the hopes that it would get eyes on their post. The plan of posting on popular Reddit threads did work, and Fujitagakan's post caught the eye of someone who then posted about it on the Reddit Bureau of Investigation. By the time this user found the post, only one person had replied to any of them. An now deleted user by the name of Flapblip responded to several of Fujitagakan's posts with contact information for Amnesty International's branch in Thailand. Flapflip only replied to four out of the dozens of posts that existed, and the rest of her post history shows that it was just mostly a normal person's regular Reddit account and not tied to the Fujitagakan account in any way. I only refer to her as being mostly normal because of the post in which she declared, Pineapple pizza sucks. An objectively incorrect and bizarre opinion for any rational person to hold. Fight me. No, Kevin, I won't fight you. I also love pineapple pizza. Hawaii pizza is, is great. I think we're in the minority, though, Kevin. But... If we ever meet up, we can share a pineapple pizza together. It'll be fantastic. 
Anyway, based on the series of nearly identical posts, it was determined that there were three possible theories for what was going on. It was some sort of spam bot, it was a troll, or it was real and being posted by somebody who was in trouble. After a little bit of researching, people identified that there was a small facility called the Pajita Geekan Thai Company Limited in Bang Triang, Thailand. This facility is the Thai branch of a Japanese company. And so far, this makes sense. Assuming the posts were genuine, they could have been made by a Japanese national who was working at this facility. That would explain the singular Japanese language post, as well as the fact that the frequently repeated post sounded like a shitty Google translation. It also potentially explained why they never replied to anyone. Multiple people responded to Fujitagakan's post asking for more details or offering help, but none of them ever received a reply. This could be because the person making the posts didn't actually speak English, and they also could have had extremely limited internet access, only able to access Reddit in secret and very intermittently. That was supported by the timing of the posts, which also seemed to rule out the idea of it being a bot making them. The timing of the posts was indicative of a human poster rather than a bot, as was the error of double-pasting the message. Since the consensus was that it was most likely a real person leaving these messages, that raised another question. Was this a cry for help, or was it a hoax? I mean, this is just not enough information to do anything with, isn't it? Is it? And then, I mean, you could ask for more information, but they can't reply. And then you're never going to be able to like get the Thai police halfway around the world to like go and raid some... Japanese company's factory and wherever the f Operating on the assumption that it was better safe than sorry, people tried to reach out to organizations like Amnesty International, though with no response. That's not terribly surprising, but users noted that the Thailand's branch of Amnesty International wouldn't even pick up the phone. Of course, it's not like there was a lot that they could do anyway. Thailand has a reputation for frequent and horrific human rights violations, including human trafficking and various forms of slave labor, including wage slavery. The initial posts were also made not long after Thailand passed laws making it more difficult for amnesty groups to do their jobs, in some cases trying to bar them from entering the country entirely. So, if this was a hoax, someone had certainly done their homework. They picked a country where it would be believable, a company that existed, and even added authenticity by making a post in Japanese. Not only did the company exist, but it was an extremely small and obscure company, particularly the branch in Thailand that was a machining manufacturer. It wasn't the sort of name someone would likely discover randomly unless they knew exactly what they were looking for. Also, why is this random Japanese person working in like wage slavery or whatever in, a, in Thailand? Like they got human traffic to Thailand? I feel like if you had the factory there, you'd have like your local slaves. Like, you, why would you import your slaves if you're going to do slavery? As a side note, there was speculation that this may not have been the correct company. In addition to Fujita Geekin Co. Ltd., there are two unrelated Japanese companies, Fujita and Geekin, prompting the idea that perhaps someone was looking for a facility shared by the two companies. Looking into those companies, there didn't seem to be any link between the two of them, nor did either of them have operations in Thailand. While that was essentially a random dead end, it's worth mentioning because it means that the name wasn't completely unique. Theoretically, even if the posts were genuine, people may have found the wrong facility in Thailand. There was another interesting discovery, however, which was another user. Fujitagakan001 started posting on February the 22nd, 2017, but similar posts had been made between February the 17th and the 21st on the account help 00100101. The account was suspended by Reddit, so people didn't find it immediately, but even deleted posts on Reddit are stored and searchable using the right tools. Many of the posts were the exact same copy and pasted messages that Fujitagen001 had made, but there were a couple of different ones as well. There was slightly more variation in these posts, mainly in terms of capitalization, but that's further evidence that this was not a bot doing this. There were also two more posts written in Japanese, including the first post made by the user. The first of these translates to, I was told to shut up because it was long and incoherent, and my voice was irritating. The other translated to, I don't understand the nerve of narcissism when you hurt someone and still keep asking them to date you. I guess he doesn't understand other people's pain because he loves himself the most. And there are strange people out there who would date someone like that. Both of these posts were copied directly from threads on 2chan, the Japanese image board that was the precursor to 4chan. What is going on? This is really odd. 
The first thread was about how to get a diagnosis from, for ADHD and the treatment options, and the second was about dealing with people who have narcissistic personality disorder. Those messages are obviously a little different, and there's a bit of speculation about them, of course. However, Help posted one other extremely unusual message. Instead of any text regarding needing help or human rights violations, the post was just the customer service email forwarding address of a Swedish furniture company. No, not that Swedish furniture company, a different one. But now I do want Swedish meatballs. So, what the hell does this mean then? Clearly, it had to be the same user. The accounts were posting identical messages and one was created right after the other was banned. But why was there the random email address? Again, there's always the chance that this was all a bizarre and elaborate troll. But there is another explanation as well. I feel like a copy and paste, like copying and pasting email addresses is pretty common. Like, so if you're wanting to, you want to post your like weird help message for whatever reason, and then you've just sent an email to a Swedish furniture company, you could just copy and paste, you could just paste it and post it and then be like, oh, that was the wrong thing, but I'm just posting a bunch of stuff. So you just go back and copy the right thing. Like people paste the wrong things all the time. As I mentioned, it's likely that the person in question would have had very limited access to the internet if this was a genuine cry for help. If that's the case, it's not unreasonable to think that they could have been sharing a device with someone else. It's possible they just pasted and submitted the comment without realizing that somebody else had saved something into the clipboard already exactly. The messages from Tu Shan are a bit more confusing. It certainly makes it seem like this person was going through something and looking for help and attention on any random message board that they could find. Assuming that the user was copying messages they'd posted on 2chan, that is, it's possible that these were also saved to the clipboard by someone else, or again, that none of this was real, and this troll just copied random Japanese text that they found online. If the 2chan posts were made by the same person, who then posted them on Reddit, however, the things they were describing, while unpleasant, are hardly what people think of as human rights violations. So, what in the actual fuck is going on here? Especially since the idea that this was all a hoax is very much a minority opinion. I think the best explanation comes from a combination of the sh unreliability of Google Translate, especially in 2017, combined with the phrase power harassment that appeared earlier. While that sounds like another example of awkward translation, power harassment is the official phrase used in Japan having been coined in 2002. Note that this was from the post that was written in Japanese as well, so we know for certain that phrase wasn't a translation error. Power harassment is extremely broad and encompasses a whole host of activities. It could be something as subdued as manipulating an employee by saying something like, Oh, you don't want to come into work on your day off? That's such a shame because your name was coming up for promotion. But it also is... <laughs> <laughs> aka being a boss but it also includes things like physical and verbal abuse sexual harassment and being and pretty much any other awful behavior you can think of aka being a really boss it's a big problem in japan and in 2016 a government survey said more than 30 percent of japanese employees admitted to being victims of power harassment Based on the comments from the two Chan threads, it's possible that this person was experiencing power harassment in the forms of verbal abuse, sexual harassment, and a narcissistic boss, and in other unspecified ways. Though it's not quite the slavery that people initially assumed, it's still something that would be taken seriously if the employers were caught, with the victims being compensated by Japanese courts for whatever bullying and harassment they had endured. Of course, I do need to circle back to the troll theory for a moment. Most trolls just do it for the lulls, but there is a potentially more specific motive here. It's possible that the user was a Japanese troll who, for whatever reason, wanted to damage the reputation of Fujita Geek and Tai. And if that was the goal, it certainly worked. The company was review bombed, receiving a legion of one star reviews saying they should be shut down for trafficking and slavery. Holy sh that's going to be bad for business! Those negative reviews have since been removed, but they are instead replaced with five-star reviews that include comments like, It's very nice here, yes, yes, they absolutely have no slaves, and you don't get harassed. Please don't help me. <laughs> While this seems like a very roundabout way to deliberately damage a company's reputation, especially since it was only damaged in the eyes of Western audiences who are unlikely to have ever hired the facility anyway, it is still a theoretical motivation. Unfortunately, we don't actually know the truth. All of the information available comes from this single Reddit account, and there's very little to go on. People, myself included, are generally of the opinion that this was a genuine cry from help from someone in a desperate situation, though I'm less convinced it was quite as bad as most people can uh, believe. It's been seven years since Fruta Chag again begged for help, and we're no closer to knowing who the person was or what horrors they were claiming to endure. 
And since their second account wasn't suspended by Reddit, we have no idea what happened that caused them to suddenly stop posting. There's only been a single update since all this went down in 2017, and it's probably just a fun coincidence. In December 2020, a thread popped up on the Internet Mysteries subreddit about the user and whether or not it was a genuine cry for help. This again brought attention to the mystery, which in turn brought negative attention and reviews to the factory in Thailand. <laughs> if this is just a random factory, they would just be like, what the f***, man, why? A month later, in January 2021, a YouTube video was uploaded showing the Fujita Geek entire factory saying what a great, safe, and friendly workplace it was. But hey, like I said, the timing of those things is probably a coincidence. Lake City Quiet Pills I have a long and annoying history with this story. Although not everything we cover on this channel is unsolved, I personally prefer to only cover topics that still have a bit of mystery surrounding them. This became a problem two years ago when I first started writing about Lake City Quiet Pills. What on earth is this? It was back when I was covering every internet mystery I could find for this channel, and I was about three quarters of the way through the script. But then I discovered something horrible. The mystery had a definitive solution. I angrily deleted my partially completed script and moved on to something else. Oh, I, I have to say, Kevin, I like it. It's satisfying when there's like a, a solution. In the time since then, this has been the most heavily requested internet mystery that I haven't yet covered. More importantly, as I looked into it again, I'm not at all convinced that this is actually solved, and I'm pretty annoyed with myself for so quickly dismissing my investigation last time. So with all that needless backstory out of the way, it's okay, Kevin, it was like two paragraphs. It's finally time to cover the story that you've all been waiting for, and really, Simon, who can blame them for requesting this one? After all, the hero of our story is a man named Milo, aka Religion of Peace. And for years, his biggest claim to fame was being a moderator for the subreddit r slash jailbait. Don't worry, Simon. This isn't actually that type of story. I, I mean, it sort of is, but it also might involve the assassination of Hamas's chief of logistics. <laughs> How are these things related? Where is this going? It's definitely a weird one, so let's just get to it. Milo created the Religion of Peace Reddit account in December of 2007. He was a terminally online douchebag who would frequently tell people to fuck off and die, or tell people to go back to France because we don't do socialism here. Milo had a lot of strong political beliefs and he loved to talk about them, but one of his favorite activities was complaining about spam. He would frequently make posts yelling at or about spam bots as if the people behind the spam bots gave a shit what he had to say. They don't. They don't even read it, dude. Much to his annoyance, Reddit didn't seem to care either. Or at the very least, the site, which had only been around a couple of years at this point, didn't yet have the ability to alleviate their spam problem. Aside from being an arsehole, Milo is known for two things, being a 79-year-old war veteran who loved to talk about weapons and his time in the service, and being an active moderator on the highly controversial Jailbait subreddit. Wait, is he really 79? This kind of like trolling the bots and sharing your political opinions and telling people to go back to France feels very more much like edgelord teenager, not 79-year-old veteran. That subreddit has long since been deleted, but I've seen the content described in two different ways. Some say it was explicit images of porn stars who looked underage but weren't, and others said it was suggestive but clothed images of girls who were underage. It could easily have been both, as neither type would be illegal, and both would appeal to the same type of creepy pervert. However, despite all of the controversy surrounding the subreddit, Milo managed to largely stay in the background. As a fun side note, the founder of r slash jailbait received a gold-plated alien bobblehead from Reddit for his significant contributions to the site, an award that he proudly showed off during an interview did on CNN after having been doxxed and losing his job thanks to the numerous controversial subreddits he founded. That all came years later, though. <laughs> What's this guy's life? Back to Milo. Like I said, he was a 79-year-old military veteran, or at least so he claimed. It's the internet, so people can say whatever they want. And for many people, Milo's story was a bit hard to swallow because it was just so fantastical. According to his posts, he was born in 1930 and enlisted in the US Army at the age of 13 to go and fight in World War II. By itself, that's not impossible, though times have changed. Back then, Americans were almost universally opposed to the Nazis, and lots of people were eager to go to war. There are countless cases of underage kids successfully enlisting in the military, and we know for sure that some of them were as young as 14 at the time. Yeah, I mean, like, 13 does seem extremely low. Like, I knew, I know, I know, like, from British history, the kids who were pretty young, or like just below the conscription age, or the, the, the age you have to be to go volunteer, were inducted into the army. But I, 13 feels very young. 
hell there was even a kid in my school who was six feet tall by the time he was 10 jesus so i'm sure he could have enlisted in world war ii if he was when he was 13 if he wanted to you know if it wasn't 50 years too late but the specific details of milo's service were a bit too extraordinary he claimed to have stormed the beaches of normandy and been present at other extremely high profile battles as well again not impossible but it seemed highly implausible milo also claimed to have been stationed in palestine from 1946 to 1949 as part of his service during the cold war though u.s military presence in palestine during that time was minimal there were troops all over europe following world war ii but u.s activities in the middle east were mainly diplomatic rather than involving boots on the grounds yeah but i mean everywhere there's u.s ba uh, diplomatic thing or whatever there's going to be marines there's going to be people in uh like protecting that embassy or whatever or military base even more suspicious than the details of milo's claimed military career was that he loved to talk about it you'd think that someone who saw as much serious combat as he did would either have pretty severe ptsd or at the least would want to think about it as little as possible but milo was quite the opposite and nobody really questioned it it was clear that he had extensive knowledge of war and armaments so everyone just kind of rolled with his story of course there still needed to be an explanation for why this guy was terminally online in 2009 there weren't a lot of 79 year olds hanging out on the internet all day milo's explanation was that he got a job in a re in a computer related field after retiring from the military which was great for him because it didn't require much physical effort again this isn't impossible but it's extremely suspicious if he was 79 in 2009 like he claimed that meant milo was 65 in 1995. back then people could actually retire at 65. Wait, what's the retirement age today? I thought it was still 65. Is it not 65? Especially since he would have a military pension, so it seemed weird that he'd be working so late in life. Again, though, it seems clear that Milo did have a lot of knowledge about computers and even programming. I do also have to mention that there was a post in which he instead claimed his age was 70, not 79. Many people see that as definitive proof that the entire story was bullshit, while others argue it's simply a typo since 9 and 0 are next to each other on the keyboard. Yeah, that's fair enough. Could just be a typo i think a more interesting post that would call milo's age into question was his reply on a thread about anime he cited cowboy bebop as the show that got him into anime a show that first aired in the u.s in 2001 would a 71 year old man really stay up until midnight to watch his very first anime on adult swim i mean cowboy bebop is pretty awesome so maybe but personally i find that harder to believe than everything else about milo's history yeah i don't believe that milo is a 79 year old veteran i believe that milo is an edge lord a teenage edge lord someone that old who enjoyed anime would almost certainly cite astro boy and speed racer as the shows that got them into it if you say so kevin i know nothing about anime all right so what's the big deal random internet troll who happens to know a lot about war guns and computers was lying about his identity so that he could score fake internet points that happens every day so what makes milo's story so special on may the 18th 2009 milo left the same post on multiple different subreddits these posts were titled i got tired of using commercial image hosts i set up my own you can use it if you want to the text of the post was a link to lakecityquietpills.com a site whose landing page referred to it as that old guy's image host people usually used well-known image hosting sites like imager but sometimes those sites would get overwhelmed with traffic and load slowly plus those sites had actual times of service that needed to be adhered to given that milo was a moderator for r slash jailbait it was pretty much a given that that old guy's image host would have a different enforcement of certain policies and as would be expected it became the image host of choice for the subreddit for the next two months milo would promote his website as frequently as he could on the morning of july the 17th he commented in a thread directed at reddit's admins to once again complain about the problem of spam bots advertising fake lawyers and local businesses it was a very typical post for him to make and it didn't gain any attention as most of his complaints about bots on the site didn't just 13 hours later a post would be made on the subreddit for reddit.com by a user simply named 2 6. the accounts had been made that same day and this post plus a couple of replies to the post made over the next few days was the only thing 2 to 6 would ever post on reddit his post was titled the end of religion of peace he died today the post read i'm the person who provided religion of peace the space for that old guy's image host milo died today he was 79 years old he died at his desk looking at your site milo was a mean old fucker mean and ownery he hooked me up with my first gig when i got out of the army i didn't like finding him 
like that. Milo don't have any living relatives and no real friends, and other than his landlady and a few people where he worked, he didn't talk to anyone about much of anything. Me, he just tolerated. As I said, he was mean. I think he used that as a shield to keep people away from him. Milo thought God was some kind of con game thought up by some lazy sons of bitches who didn't want to work every day. So he's going to the far on Monday without a service, just like he wanted. I'm planning to dump his ashes in the woods in PA, near where he was born. Can't put them right there, because there's a mall now. I gave the girl next door his raggedy old coat and most of his books. His computers and tronics he'd tagged for the disabled vets and VVA. All the rest of the stuff is for the Salvation Army. All those years and everything he owned fits in the trunk of my car. I don't know what else to say. I'll miss him miserable bastard that was hard to read <laughs> the english was not very good the thread was full of comments supporting milo and thanking two to six for passing on the news with his beautiful eulogy a bunch of people did comment on the fact that he was a moderator for r slash jail bay but nobody seemed to care as they saw it he was a cranky old man and a war hero who was fighting against spammers sure he may have liked younger girls but he was old as shit all the women were young compared to him while I understand that sentiment, it would be better justification if he was a modera moderator for r slash women 40 plus still hot AF or something. <laughs> However, the thread started to gain traction, eventually amassing 614 upvotes. That's certainly not a lot by today's standards, where posts get tens of thousands of upvotes, but in the early days of Reddit, it absolutely was. And since that meant he was getting pushed to the top of the reddit.com subreddit, suddenly there were a lot of eyes on it. Eyes who had no idea who Milo was, so they wanted to investigate. After all, this guy was a moderator for a controversial and barely legal subreddit, and he died just hours after his most recent post. And suddenly a brand new account appeared to announce the guy's death. Many people thought this was far too convenient. Like Milo was trying to kill off his account to escape any future controversy that r slash jailbait might bring to his doorstep. But what they found was much stranger than anything they had expected. Yeah, I think that's exactly what's going on. That's exactly the assumption I would make. I'm very curious to see where this goes, because apparently it's going somewhere else. In his comment history, they found a comment he left on an article about the CIA. I always get a laugh when I read articles demonstrating such naivety. Of course, there are assassinations. There are some things that the legal system can't fix. So many people actually believe that as fucked up as things are right now, and as they have been for the last 20 years, that they aren't needed. What do you want to bet that Bernie Madoff follows Ken Lay's path? I th can think of any number of criminal organizations that would benefit from a dose of Lake City quiet pills. What does this mean? To the best of my knowledge, this was the only time that Milo had actually used the phrase Lake City quiet pills on Reddit. It was a bizarre phrase that nobody understood why he chose as the name of his image hosting website, but based on the previous comment, it certainly sounded like it was a reference to bullets. Okay. Okay, I, I get that. I kind of thought it would be a reference to poison, but okay. A possible connection was drawn between the phrase and the Lake City Army Ammunition Plant in Independence, Missouri. Perhaps this was slang for bullets that had been picked up on during his stay in the military or something. But why use it as the name for the image host? We'll get back to that in a second, but first a little more about the Redditor 2 to 6. It's an unusual name to be sure, so people began trying to figure out more about Milo's supposed friends. One of the first discoveries was on FARC, a news aggregate site founded in 1999. On the forums there, they found a user by the name of Angel26. The email address the person used to register their account in 2001 was angel.2.6 at lakecityquietpills.com. Back in the day, it was common on internet forums for users to have digital signatures as well. This was a little message that was placed at the bottom of every post bait made by that user. Yeah, I remember these. Sometimes it was a link to something they really liked or a banner image, but more often than not, it was a quote the person wanted to be remembered by. In the case of Angel, their signature read, Dispensing Lake City Quiet Pills to Lousy Bastards in Need of Permanent Rest Since 1968. They also listed their location as Hell because this dude was super f***ing edgy. This was obviously a very clear link between Angel and Milo, and it interestingly showed that the website had existed long before Milo had started to advertise it as an unsavory image host. Looking deeper at Angel's posts, there were quite a lot of similarities in content as well. They wrote the same sort of political opinions, complained about spam, and had an identical writing style. 
I gave Simon the raw version of the post made on Reddit by Angel to showcase how poorly written it was. <laughs> because the users even made the same typos. One that jumped out was that they both spelled muriatic acid as muratic acid. Though it is just the case of a single missing letter, people tend to subvocalize while they write, and that is an odd way to misspell muriatic given how it's pronounced. Searching around the internet, investigators discovered the username Angel26 used on multiple other websites as well. They talked about similar topics such as military weapons and spam filtering, but perhaps the most interesting was the account for a site called ZBrush. ZBrush is a tool for making 3D models, and Angel seemed to be involved in making models that were... Let's just say that if they were real people, they would have been illegal. The sort of thing that tracks, given what LCQP, uh, Lake City Quiet Pills, uh, would later host on their image boards. But this mystery didn't become famous because some perverts were discovered to enjoy gross but technically legal things. It's because of what was found hiding in plain sight on the LCQP website. If you enter the website without any specific page or subdirectory listed in the URL, the landing page that was loaded was completely blank. This seemed weird, as normally it would be expected to display a 404 error or redirect somewhere rather than just loading a blank page. Look in the source code, like right-click view source and see what's actually there. Trying to figure out what was wrong with the website, people looked at the source code for the page to see what was going on. Instead of a coding error, what they found was looked to be a secret job listing board. The owner of LCQP had removed it from the Wayback Machine last year, which makes finding the full text of these messages more difficult. However, based on all the other reporting, the messages look for people for jobs in Europe and Asia, but specifically not the Middle East. What is going on? The jobs used a lot of abbreviations, but they requested people or groups with specific language skills and vague details on payment. Are they looking for spies? Many also specified that no papers were needed, which certainly indicates a level of illegality to what was going on. Some common abbreviations that appeared were CCW, indicating the person needed a concealed carry weapons permit, and WW. In this context, WW could either stand for warrants for wants and warrants, suggesting those particular gigs were bounty hunting operations, or it could be the much more nefarious wet works. I assume Simon knows this, but for anyone unaware, it's uh, assassinations. Wet work is a euphemism for contract killing. Not every listing was quite so intense, though. For example, one listing was just looking for four English slash French speakers to work as private security on a cruise. What is going on here? What? I can I, I do, I do not understand. So yeah, the pervy image hosting service also appeared to be a secret job hosting site for a bunch of assassins and mercenaries. The hidden message board would be updated regularly, for example, with a message about Milo's death and a follow-up about where the ashes were spread. A few weeks later, there was another update saying that Milo's will cleared probate and it turned out that he was loaded. Disbursement of the money was being handled by someone known as Shade, who would pay out to everyone based on how many jobs they had done in the previous four years. That's all interesting, and there were definitely theories that LCQP was actually a secret job board for assassins, but it didn't get a lot of traction. That would change a few months later, however. The website was again updated with the hidden message, Happy New Year, everyone! We're having a birthday party for the old man on the 19th. Party starts at 1500 at the usual. Send your RSVP to Shade. FYI, we're booking a room for three days for anyone coming from out of area and overnight for locals. Come hoist one for Dutch Milo. This is so strange. The rabbit hole is so deep. On its own, this would honestly make me even more suspicious that this was all some sort of hoax or alternate reality game. There had always been a lot of typos involved, but they misspelled the word happy, for fuck's sake. It feels really deliberate at this point, but that's not important. I totally missed that they misspelled happy. Oh yeah, <laughs> you just gloss over things when they're spelled incorrectly, don't you sometimes? January the 19th at 3 p.m., a group of international assassins were being invited to a party for Milo. A few days later, a new update was made. We got 38 rooms in the Marriott on 46. Shade has the key cards for locals. Pick up at the party, give your travel name to the desk, and that's it. No ID needed since we're covering the bill. Keep the room service under 500, okay? The phones there are not secure. Bus from the hotel, leafs at 13.30, car service vouchers for return trip when you're ready to crash. Don't DUI. These are some admittedly strange instructions for what was supposed to be a regular party for their deceased friend, especially the part about the phones not being secure, but whatever. I mean, maybe it's just like, yeah, it's an assassin's party, so you're just like, okay, yeah, just, uh. <laughs> That's the sort of things that assassins care about when getting invited to a party. 
Once again, people were more than a little reluctant to take any of this seriously. But then, 3 p.m. on January the 19th rolled around, the time the party was set to begin. According to CCTV footage, it was around 3 p.m. local time in Dubai when Mahmoud al Mabou, chief of logistics and weapons procurement for Hamas, arrived at the Ratana Hotel. After he checked in at the front desk, he was followed to his room by two men wearing tennis gear. After seeing what room Mahmoud entered, they went back to the desk and checked into the room directly across the hall. Mahmoud left the hotel at about 8 p.m., at which point four men used a device to reprogram the lock to his door and let themselves in. Oh my god, some spy is going down. When he returned to his room, he was ambushed and injected with succinylcholine, a powerful and fast-acting muscle relaxant used to cause short-term paralysis. He was then electrocuted and smothered to death with a pillow. What the f*** is going on? What what happened with this episode, Kevin? This is insane! When hotel staff found Mahmoud the next day, it was initially assumed he'd died of natural causes. It wasn't until a week later that a preliminary forensics report said that he was murdered. At that point, the security footage was reviewed and eventually released to the public. It was discovered that there were somewhere between 18 and 28 men involved, and that they had rented rooms in numerous hotels across Dubai. They had all fl- Why do you need so many people to kill this dude? They had flown in the day before, but by the evening of the 19th, they were all gone. The men had all flown in from and departed to different locations in at least half a dozen countries, all using fake or falsified documents to travel. Wait, was this birthday party just a cover for a giant assassination job? Maybe. Suddenly, people were taking LCQP a lot more seriously, and the once obscure mystery became one of the most well-known mysteries in Reddit's history. With all the added attention on the site, the posts on the hidden message board began being encrypted. People kept cracking the encryption, so eventually this was abandoned entirely. I think, anyway. The way this has been described is as the source code no longer being used for communications, but there are also references to one final message that nobody was able to decode. Unfortunately, since the site is no longer on the Wayback Machine, I have no way to verify which is the case. So who were all these people? Was it really a group of highly trained assassins, or was it a hoax or ARG, it's an alternate reality game, that just happened to get really lucky by having a major assassination take place at the random date and time that they'd picked? It certainly seems like a massive coincidence, but the secret messages had explicitly said that they weren't sending anyone to the Middle East. There's also no other evidence that LCQP was in any way involved in Mahmoud's assassination, just this one piece, piece of extraordinary circumstantial evidence. It's a hell of a coincidence. As investigations continued, a new lead was discovered. In late 2011, r jailbait was shut down, but LCQP still continued to operate as an image host. Many of those images had a watermark for a website known as DSF or DrunkenStepfather.com. Sorry, Simon, we're back to that shit again. And wouldn't you know it, the public-facing side of this forum was dedicated to pictures of nude celebrities and such, but there was also a private section containing, well, you can probably assume what was inside there. Brilliant. Gaining access to this private section requires manual approval from the site's administrator, which can only be earned after making two to 700 posts on the forums, or by uploading a picture of your tits with DSF written across them. The point is that it takes a lot of time, effort, and trust building with the site owner to actually get access to the exclusive members-only section, but again, I'm confident that we know what's going on in there. And wouldn't you know it, to support that theory was a forum thread posted by none other than our good friend 2-6. The post was about how LCQP was operating for the sole purpose of hosting DSF out of the owner's pocket. Now at this point, we can get really lost in the weeds on this one. There's a lot of names from the DSF forums and a whole lot of site drama and whatnot, but it's really not important. Short version, Angel26 died, someone else took over, ownership of things changed like a dozen times, whatever. At the end of the day, the story is irrelevant because it's all just one person. It's all Milo. Except there is no Milo. There's only Zool. I mean Mike. Looking up old domain registration information, it shows that LCQP was purchased using a domain host called crystalwind.com. Crystalwind was run by a guy named Mike Adams, and it was a normal website, until it wasn't. There would be political messages posted on the official company site. There were weird links saying, don't use these email contacts, and other bizarre things. But most importantly, in 2004, on April Fool's Day, the website was updated for the first time in multiple years. The new website featured the same blank landing page as LCQP, and the page featured secret messages hidden within the source code. These messages didn't hint at contract killings or anything. Instead, 
having information about graphing calculators, but it was still a pretty definitive link between LCQP and crystal winds. After all, that wasn't exactly a common way of passing information to people. If that wasn't enough, in a deep dive on the topic, YouTube Nexpo was able to find an email address linked to one of the Angel26 accounts that was different from the others. By searching for this email address, he was able to find Mike A, who also had an email address on crystal winds. There's a whole lot more to this rabbit hole that I could explain, but honestly, it's pretty pointless, because the majority of it is just one dude talking to himself through a bunch of different aliases. Instead of going through that, we can just look at the two main theories behind LCQP. First, it was all real. Even if the details of Milo's life and a lot of other stories were fake, the website really did feature a secret message board used by mercenaries or assassins or whatever. This is certainly the more intriguing of the two theories, but it's pretty hard to believe. The only evidence that any of it is real is the assassination of Mahmoud, and again, that's highly circumstantial. It doesn't help that Mossad took credit for the assassination, though to be fair, it is believed that they may have hired outside agents to take part in the operation, so technically this theory isn't disproven, but I find it extremely unlikely. And that leaves the other main theory, which is that Mike did all of this just for shits and giggles, or possibly as a little bit of misdirection. The main purpose of LCQP that can be definitely pro proven was to host barely legal or possibly even illegal images. That's not something that tends to go over well, and as an extraordinarily active and outspoken user on Reddit, a lot of people were aware of the existence of Religion of Peace, and all of those people knew him as a moderator for r slash jailbait. Perhaps he saw the writing on the wall, and he wanted to get the fuck out of Dodge before it was too late. It hadn't happened yet when the death of Religion of Peace was reported, but the founder of r slash jailbait was doxxed and lost his job. His life was ruined, and with good cause. After all, this wasn't the only subreddit he founded. His other contributions to the site included the likes of r slash creepshots, r slash chokabitch, and r slash pics of dead kids. This guy's f disturbed, bro. But nothing like that happened to Mike slash Milo, so why not? Sure, he wasn't as infamous or hated as the r slash jailbait founder, but he was still pretty well known and hated. And it's not unreasonable to think that all of this was just meant as a distraction, a big mystery that people could focus on that would take their attention from the actual gross shit that he was doing. When he picked a random date and time for Milo's funeral, he got insanely lucky and ran into a coincidence so big that people still obsess about it over a decade later. If that was the case, it was certainly a clever plan and it worked. Well, it wasn't really a plan. <laughs> It was just like, if that was the case, then he got insanely lucky. Of course, there's also a third option as to what happens, which is allegedly the truth. In 2019, YouTuber Barely Social made one of the first, and possibly the first, deep dive videos on the mystery of Lake City Quiet Pills. Just three months after his video came out, he came to Twitter to expose the truth. Everything was a hoax created by Mike and one of his friends, who were hardcore Second Life players and also furries. They played on Second Life server called Blue Fur Industries, or something of that nature, and the hidden messages on LCQP were potentially invites to swingers' parties. The members of the DSF forums weren't really part of the hoax, aside from the 50 or so accounts created by Mike, but they actively kept the legend of LCQP being a site for contract killings alive. Though that's pretty similar to one of the main theories, it's a much more wild narrative. However, Barely Sociable didn't provide any proof of any of this, which is honestly pretty weird. His video had amassed millions of views, but he just couldn't be bothered to make another video on the topic. I'm not trying to sh throw shade or anything, but I really can't understand that decision. Yeah, it'd be great to see some proof. If I wrote a video for Simon about a mysterious website believed to be used for contract killings that got millions of views, and then I personally discovered proof that no, they're actually fucking furries who are using the site to plan swingers parties, you best believe I would be writing the sequel to that video before anybody else found out and beat me to it. Regardless, although this mystery is technically unsolved, it's probably best to lay this one to rest. In all likelihood, it was all just a hoax, either just for fun or to distract people from LCQP's main goal. Even if it really was a website used to hire mercenaries for contract killings, it doesn't matter anymore, because the website is long gone, so there's nowhere else for Mike to post job listings. That is, unless he moved the operation to a dark web server that he set up immediately after the secret activity on LCQP shut down in 2011. Yeah, which is what you do these days. <laughs> Because that's what the dark web is for, assassinations. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Appreciate it. If you listen to this podcast, why not leave a review? And as always, I'll see you next time.